This week is Parshas Mishpatim, and you are listening to the Parsha podcast with me, Rabbi Yaakov Wolby from Houston, from Torch. I hope you enjoy this class. If you do, I'd ask you to consider making a donation to our organization to support our efforts to connect Jews and Judaism. And also, if you do like the podcast, you can email me, or I guess if you don't like it, email me as well, rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you. So last week, we read about the most dramatic event in all of human history, a nation comprised of millions of people. They stood at the foot of the mountain, and they were privy to a conversation between the Almighty and Moshe at Sinai at the National Revelation at the Ten Commandments. Right after these dramatic descriptions, we get our Parsha, and the Parsha talks about all kinds of interpersonal laws. What happens the laws of, of bondsmen, the laws of animals goring each other, a lot of detailed laws about how we relate to other people's property and how we interact with each other. And at the end of the parsha, there's we go back to Sinai and we continue the Sinai narrative and describe again what happened on the run-up to the national revelation at Sinai. I want to look at a few verses in the middle of the parsha that show a little bit of the sensitivity that the Torah wants us to have towards those that are more vulnerable. So this is chapter 22. I'm going to read verse 20 until 26. You shall not taunt or oppress a stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall not cause pain to any widow or orphan. If you dare to cause him pain, for if he shall cry out to me, I will surely hear his outcry. My wrath shall blaze and I shall kill you by the sword, and your wives will be widows and your children Orphans. When you lend money to my people, to the poor person who is with you, do not act toward him as a creditor, do not lay interest upon him. If you take your fellow's garment as security, until sunset shall you return it to him, for it alone is his clothing, it is his garment for his skin. In what shall he lie down? So it will be that if he cries out to me, I shall listen, for I am compassionate. So we have these three separate sections with respect to how we're supposed to treat those that are less fortunate than us, that are more vulnerable. The first is the stranger. We can't taunt or oppress them. Someone who is an outsider, someone who just recently came and joined the clique or the society or the neighborhood or the school, they are more vulnerable. They're uncertain. They don't know exactly how things are done. And therefore, you have to be careful not to oppress them because you yourself were once like that in the land of Egypt. In addition, the widow and the orphan and the commentators add, anyone who is vulnerable, don't cause them pain. If they do and they call out to God, then you yourself might suffer and become and be forced to be put in the same situation as they are. And finally, the third law we're told here is when you lend money to the poor people, don't take interest. However, you may take a security, a collateral. But if the collateral is a garment, you have to give it back to them. So what's going to be? You want them to pay back your loan, so you take a security or collateral, but then they don't have it. So if it's their garment, it's their pajamas, well, every night you have to return it to them because otherwise, what are they going to sleep in? And what happens if you don't? So it will be that if he cries out to me, I shall listen, for I am compassionate. We're warned that if we do not give it back to him and he calls out to God, then we're on the chopping block. We're in danger. What's the danger? So the Sephorno, one of the commentaries in the Torah, he explains that when the Almighty makes someone rich or having more possessions and monetary resources than they actually need, then the reason why God gave them more than they need is so that they could help their friends who are less fortunate. If someone doesn't treat the poor person in the way they ought to, The Almighty says, okay, I'm going to take away some of the extra, excess money that I gave to you to give to him, and I'll give it to him straight away. That's what the Sephorna says. But the Ramban points out an interesting point here. If you look at verse 22, it says, if you cause pain to the widow or the orphan, and he cries out to me, I will surely hear his outcry. If the victim of your behavior calls out to God, God will hear it. In verse 26, it says something very similar. It talks about the person to whom one lends, and then they got a collateral, and they didn't give back the collateral. And there it says, so it will be, if he cries out to me, I shall listen, and it adds, for I am compassionate. So in both cases, we're told God will listen to the cry and the calling of those that are less fortunate that we pained, 
However, it adds an extra point that when you don't give back the collateral in time, I will listen, says God, because I am compassionate. And the Ramban brings a very powerful idea to explain this. The word for I am compassionate is ki chanun anim. I am chanun. I am compassionate. Says the Ramban, the word chanun is etymologically linked to the word chinam. Chinam means free. And the obvious question is, if I lend someone money, I take a collateral because that is an incentive for the person to pay me back. And if they don't pay me back, I could, I could keep the collateral. So this is the way things are done. If you borrow money, you have to give some security to ensure the lender that you're going to pay back. And thus, the lender, when they hold the collateral, they're justified. They're not some sort of perpetrator who's doing something wrong. They're just keeping the collateral and trying to pressure the borrower to pay back. That's what a collateral after all is for. So there's no justification for the victim. They're not justified. Moreover, says the Ramban, what if the victim is not righteous? They're not a tzaddik. They're not someone who's exemplary in their behavior necessarily. Yet, what does the Almighty say? I'm going to listen when he cries out to me, for I am compassionate. Like the word chinam, free. I am going to listen irrespective of the justification of the perpetrator. Yes, the perpetrator is justified. Still, I'm going to listen. And yes, maybe the crier is not righteous. But you know what? I'm going to listen anyhow. Says the Ramban, when we pray, prayer is not dependent on righteousness. There's no preconditions that you have to be righteous in, in order to pray. Even if the borrower is not righteous, they still will have God listen to them if they call out to God. And even if they really don't have a, a case, right? After all, they borrow the money and the guy was nice enough to lend without interest. All he did was take a collateral. They're not justified. So what? If they call out to God, God listens. There's an element of God's treatment of humanity wherein God accepts prayer and God acts upon that prayer irrespective of the piety of the prayer and irrespective of the justification of their situation. There's no preconditions to prayer. In fact, we have during the high holidays and various times of the year, we read the Avinu Malkenu prayer. The final one of the Avinu Malkenu is, it reads, Avinu Malkenu, our father, our king, Chanenu va'anenu, be compassionate and answer us. Same word, compassionate. Ke'ebarumasem, because we don't have any actions. We have no mitzvahs. Again, we're saying to God, we're not coming with a claim saying, oh, you know what? We're so righteous. Answer us. We're justified. Answer us. No. We're admitting freely that there's no reasonable and rational reason for God to accept our prayer, but we want him to be compassionate nonetheless. There's only one precondition to prayer, and that is sincerity. We read in the Ashrei prayer, Karov Hashem lechol korav. God is close to all those that call out to him. Lechol asher yukra'uhu bemes. To all those that call out to him truthfully. The only precondition to prayer is that we call out to God truthfully with sincerity. If we're sincere, if we recognize that we don't have any actions, we recognize ein banu masim, we recognize that we're not justified per se, we're not righteous per se, we call out to God truthfully, he'll answer to us. And I think there's a very deep insight here. From the structure of the verse, it's clear that when we pray, it's not that we're trying to evoke God's compassion. What does is, what is the verse say? So it will be that if he cries out to me, I shall listen, for I am compassionate. The Almighty is in a constant state of compassion. It's not like the prayer evoked or brought about the compassion. No, God is compassionate and is waiting for us to ask for what we need. Sincerely, even if we're not justified, even if we're not righteous, the Almighty is compassionate and will answer our prayers if we ask. And to me, this was a... This was a fantastic insight that when we're praying, we're not changing the way God treats us. We're not, we're not, we're not changing God's behavior. We're changing our behavior. God is in a constant state of compassion, ready to give us whatever we ask for, provided that we ask for it with sincerity. From Noah Weinberg, he used to give an analogy of the power of prayer to some guy who lived in, uh, in Iowa or Nebraska. 
And this guy was frustrated because there was a pothole in front of his house. And it was getting worse. And his, his cars were suffering, his tires were suffering. So he tried to call the municipality, 311, try to get someone to come fix it. Nothing happened. And then he called the, the, the county and the governor and wrote letters to Congress. Nothing. So one day he gets frustrated and just calls the White House. And the president answers the phone. And he tells him what's wrong. And the next morning, there's a team of engineers in front of his house. And they fix the pothole. He says, this is what prayer is. Prayer is we have a direct line to the president. It's a direct line to the one who gets things done. In this verse, and the Ramban, we're told that we have a direct line to the Almighty, and it's only up to us to make a sincere effort. He is already compassionate, and he's just waiting for us to ask. And I think prayer, you know, prayer is difficult because for most, prayer is limited to the synagogue, to the prayer book, to the prayer shawl, to the talis, to Hebrew. It seems like everything about formalized, ritualized prayer is designed to make it unnatural. But in truth, the history of prayer is that it took 900 years after the mitzvah of prayer was given for it to be formalized. Prayer at its core is man talking to God as man talks to his friend. You're like the child of your billionaire dad and you're asking him for your needs. And this to be done hundreds of times a day. And I always suggest for people to ad-lib, forget about the prayer book, don't forget about the prayer book, but outside of the prayer book, outside of the synagogue, outside of Hebrew, outside of the rigid structure that makes it so hard for us to connect to prayer, when you're in your car, you're on the way to work, on the way to the water cooler, you're drinking a coffee, talk to God. The Almighty has proficiency in conversational English, I assure you. Talk to God in the way you would talk to your own father. And what's the best language to speak to God? The language that you're most comfortable in. And even in the prayer itself, the the formalized, ritualized prayer, it's important for us to recognize we can always ad lib. We can always add whatever we want and speak to God as you would speak to your friend. And I think here we see what an opportunity it is. This person, this unfortunate poor person who had to borrow, and he he managed to get an interest-free loan, there was no strings attached besides for the fact that he had to pony up a collateral. And the way collaterals work is that they're supposed to be painful. That's the design. And the collateral itself is on the wrong. But if the person, the lender, does not take care to make sure that the person is not pained, and this person calls out to God, they're not justified, they may not be righteous, God is compassionate and God will answer. And this, I think, is a powerful lesson to us to try to maximize the opportunity that we have in our lives. We have a direct line to God. The Almighty is waiting to answer our call, so to speak. We could talk to the president. We could get stuff done. What an opportunity.